Commission, which I took up last May, um, was uh, as um, uh, an expert advisor. And the Commission does this. They're the full time Commission officials um, from each of the 27 member states, it's all very equal. Big shortage of Brits out there, I might add, by the way, um, are essentially policy wonks, uh, sort of. Uh, regulatory strategists working for a political elite, 27 commissioners, so there are 27 directorates general because there are 27 member states. Uh, but they tend not to have any deep experience in any of the areas that they're going to regulate. And this actually is one of the uh, issues that Oil and Gas UK is saying that the uh, European Commission hasn't got any competence. And it doesn't, but what they do is they try and pull in some experience temporarily. So I'm temporarily out in Brussels. Um, I joined um, the Health and Safety Executive uh, from BP not long after Piper Alpha. Uh, anybody in the industry at the time of Piper Alpha uh, would never shrug off, if you like, the effect of that, especially if you are British, because it was in the UK, and it's the worst ever offshore disaster there has ever been. How could that be? Um, I was director of the uh, HSE's offshore division. I stepped from there to lead the government's uh, investigation into the Bunsfield explosions and fires. Got to see all my ex-colleagues there from uh, our uh, legal uh, service um, in the audience. Um, and then before I went to the commission, I was director of the um, Emerging Energy Technologies um, Division, which was looking at the impact of all the incoming technologies, particularly offshore uh, and in carbon capture and storage um, that were coming into the economy in the UK uh, and some remarkable similarities. The um, commission uh, took me on last year, as I say, to provide this input. So that's you know, enough about me and why I'm out there. Um, I think it's worth really saying, well, what, what's the bloody commission got to get yourself involved in uh, with, uh, with offshore regulation? Now, I, I have to say, I did think about that myself uh, when I was uh, safely here in the UK, but looking at uh, the Macondo disaster, um, I've been in the oil industry all my life in one form or another, and um, uh, you could see in very early days it was going to be the game changer of game changers for the industry. Uh, and I mean, the basis for the Commission's interest um, is that recent major accidents, and not just uh, a condo, I might add, uh, really gave an incentive to regulators and to the industry uh, to simply recalibrate uh, the likelihood and consequences of a major offshore accident. And that's what major accidents tend to do, certainly in you know, the world that we live, um, here in the West, as it were. Uh, and that's right, it's shameless not to, isn't it? To not examine these incidents, to see what you learn from it. Uh, and what did we learn from Macondo, Montara, P36, Brent Bravo, Mumbai High? These are some incidents, disasters that have occurred uh, since the turn of the millennium. Um, and they are the, the kind of precursor conditions you break out the bits that led to the, to the, to the, to the, you know, to the incident happening. That these events, these likelihoods, these symptoms are present in just about every jurisdiction, more or less in every jurisdiction, uh, and no country, no state can have the sum total of best practice. It's, that, that isn't the case. So I think it's good we might think uh, we are in the UK or the Norwegians are in their, their. Uh, their exclusive economic uh, zone, so to speak. Um, therefore, uh, it was necessary, I think, uh, to identify the best practices in process safety uh, and major accident response. And we're not talking here about um, 
occupational health and safety, slips, trips, falls from height, that kind of thing, nor uh, the day-to-day -day occupational, if you like, emissions and discharges uh, to the environment and to the atmosphere, um, to the sea and to the, at to the atmosphere, um, that are everybody's job, you know, all the time in this system. We're talking about major accident prevention here. And let's see if there's an optimum framework um, in which industry can significantly reduce the risks and they do need to be significantly reduced uh, of a major accident that is and equally what should be the role of the regulator uh, in achieving this outcome. So that was a sort of uh, uh, the kind of synopsis if you like the uh, storyboard with which the commission went into this, uh, this business um, and where it was kind of uh, going when I got out there last year. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, just have a little look at this. What um, is going on in the European Union countries and around? You know, Southern Mediterranean. Um, you know, the Baltic, the Black Sea, and so on. Um, Caspian. Uh, look at the concentration. Look at the deep blue bits as well, because these are our deep water areas. See how much of that there is. Uh, and I'll just give you a bit of context then. Um, uh, you know, just a sort of handful of things to be thinking about while you saw that slide. Um, and that's that safety and environmental protection require uh, financial and intellectual investment, just like any other key part of your uh, major industrial business. Um, and that's self-evidently true, I hope you'll accept. Um, the offshore sector is not shipping, but it is definitely trans transboundary. Um, and, but in the European Union, and even in the North Sea, where you think it'd be fairly homogeneous, um, there are very diverse standards uh, for regulation, uh, for equipment standards. Uh, some of the mobile rigs are classed as ships, are regulated under IMO. IMO doesn't have any competence nor pretend to have in drilling and well control, for example, so there are no uh, European standards applying to uh, um, uh, um, uh, mobile rigs, um, uh, and so no standardization under uh, pressurized equipment, uh, machinery, or um, uh, explosive atmosphere equipment, and so on. Um, reporting of incidents, you, you can hardly compare data, it's very difficult. Performance measurement, integrity management of aging structures and so on, uh, nor for emergency response. Um, there's a wide diversity of, um, of uh, standards and applications across the whole of the European Union, including the North Sea, as I say. Um, and it's an increasingly changing industry. Uh, it has to do that to survive. Operates in 11 uh, European countries and Norway. Um, there's something like 150,000 kilometers, kilometers of exposed uh, coastline uh, in Europe. Um, 6,000 active wells, that might be a surprise to some people actually, uh, and 400 of those are in Italian and Spanish waters, so it's not all in the North Sea. Uh, there's over 1,000 offshore installations in Europe, um, and more than 90% and of the oil and more than 60% of Europe's gas um, is produced in the European offshore area. Um, and these days, um, everybody is concerned about safety and the environment. So it's not just the operators have got the responsibility for it, uh, regulators who uh, clearly have that responsibility, if you like, uh, to the state for um, underpinning um, uh, those protections, but the um, workers, the, uh, the supply side, coastal economies, businesses and the general public all have feel they have some stake and if they feel they have any democratic uh, institution then indeed they do. Um, so offshore issues therefore uh, are strongly in the focus of the uh, Commission's attention and they play into these areas of competence of safety, uh, environmental protection economic sustainability uh, and security of supply. So that's the, that's the sort of operating envelope, uh, if you like. 
Um, so how did the European Commission define the problem? Um, well, the likelihood of a major incident uh, is significant uh, and can be reduced. Therefore, it's unacceptable, isn't it? I mean, if it's, if it's of significance and it can be reduced, then efforts must be made to reduce those risks. So what, the likelihood thing, uh, what's that? Well, um, the Macondo incident I in uh, April 2010 was a game changer, I've said that already, uh, of world proportions. Everybody uh, took notice of it. Now, whereas there have been uh, a number of offshore incidents, I've already mentioned Piper Alpha, um, with a worth, worse death toll uh, than um, uh, Macondo. The scale of that disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, 11 deaths, total loss of the rig, um, about half a million tons of uh, oil discharge into the Gulf and uh, losses probably in excess, and I spoke to BP about this last week, in excess of $40 billion, uh, exceeded in its sum total of environmental and safety impacts anything we've seen before. Um, now, however, uh, a previous disaster in the same region in the, in, uh, the Gulf of Mexico in the Ixtoc field in Mexico uh, in 1979 and across to 1980 was confidently predicted at the time uh, to be the worst pollution that could ever occur. It would never be seen again because, um, A, we've learned from this uh, and because of improvements in technology and human uh, systems, um, it won't be seen again. And in fact, Macondo was considerably worse in deaths and pollution. And in global terms, I mean, ignoring all the quantitative risk assessment, probabilistic uh, safety uh, analysis and so on, uh, between 1980 and uh, 2011, uh, a major offshore disaster, a disaster, you know, total loss of assets, massive pollution, huge loss of life, that kind of disaster um, has occurred every two years on average. And indeed, there were five uh, that you can confidently say were in that category between 2000 and 2010. So it's not even a tailing off. Um, uh, coming to Europe in particular, uh, the oil industry enjoyed, which is completely the opposite to the right term, uh, its own uh, decade of shame in the 80s. I just think the oil industry had gone too far to know quite how to control the offshore sector that it was exploiting um, and growing into um, at a great pace then. And we had the Alexander Keeland in... Uh, in uh, 1981 off Norway, which is a floating uh, hotel type rig alongside production platform in construction, Piper Alpha of course in 87, and there were 280 deaths in those two incidents alone. Um, and just uh, doing a reasonable quick count on the UK side, uh, there's a further major three accidents at least uh, that caused 10 deaths. Uh, in that same decade, and two major UK blowouts that uh, um, don't get a lot of publicity but which didn't escalate uh, to extreme consequences. There's one death and 23 serious uh, injuries. Uh, and a moratorium on uh, deep, uh, high pressure, high temperature drilling uh, in the UK side, which actually set that side of the business back um, a good seven or eight years, actually. Um, since then, uh, in northern EU waters, there have really been quite a large number of incidents and near misses um, that uh, have been precursors to major accidents that didn't quite occur. Um, there's an impact assessment. You're going to get a reference at the end of this presentation where you can go dig out this information and have a look at it yourself because it's been assembled in the, um, in the uh, Commission archives there. But let's just look at UK and Norway, who I think got the best regimes in the world. They, they, they spend the greatest amount of time and resource working together, uh, looking at their data, refining it and publishing it and doing what I would call proper risk assessments, um, going beyond the numbers into what's really happening and they share dim similar deep and rough waters uh, in, the, um, in the northern North Sea and Atlantic and levels of activity uh, and both report that uh, industry is not meeting its targets, its own targets for reductions in safety risk and furthermore, that the platforms are aging, many of them actually beyond their design life now, 
uh, and that the major companies are trading off their aging assets to smaller players and focusing their, the major players, activities uh, into the frontier areas of which um, there is little experience. And just to say something about the frontier areas, th there's a huge economic, exclusive economic um, zone uh, around Europe. This is just the uh, EU, just the um, European Union countries. Uh, I mean, off, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Ireland, France, Spain, Portugal, uh, on the Atlantic margins there and around, um, you know, the Canaries and the uh, uh, North um, West African coast, huge amount of deep water and uh, potential uh, big oil there. Uh, Ireland just licensed 14 uh, areas in the deep water Atlantic with no experience whatsoever of doing that and Portugal is very keen to join that. We know that uh, Cyprus has made some deep water dis gas discoveries here, hugely deep in terms of geology and in terms of water. Of course, it's quite an interesting geopolitical zone around here as well, uh, which uh, Cyprus is becoming involved in. Um, so in terms of the consequences um, of a major incident, uh, the main focus has got to be, hasn't it, on the operators who create and benefit from these risks. Um, and the overarching objective has got to be to prevent an accident from occurring, primary containment, keeping everything where it should be. It is necessary to also uh, apply best practices to response uh, should disaster nonetheless occur. That's the responsible way to go about it. Um, I'm sure you don't disagree with that. Uh, and the provisions in Europe uh, are by no means bad. But they kind of vary from region to region, um, you know, between the Mediterranean, the North Sea, the Atlantic, um, the Baltic, and the Black Seas, for example. Um, and there are improvements possible everywhere, and, and bits you can take from the various regions and add it together to uh, to a, um, a, if you like, a more robust framework. Uh, for example, both in combining both industry and national response inventories at the moment. That isn't done, uh, and driving very hard for better interoperability and uh, compatibility of response equipment. Uh, and probably more fundamentally, especially when you look at what happened in the condo and uh, the situation that's now uh, underway in the UK North Sea on the Total Elgin uh, uh, platform, that uh, major accident prevention systems for safety are currently nowhere integrated uh, with environmental protection. In other words, the consequences, what happens if either everybody's dead or recovered safely or whatever, what then do you do about the uh, escalating incident after afterwards? And that's the case even in the North Sea. Okay, so the case for EU action. Um, well, this industry, the offshore industry in which I been associated just about all of my professional life is both responsible for and, cap uh, and capable of bringing off absolutely major miracles uh, of marine engineering. Um, but it's also clear that uh, the top levels of safety performance are not sustained and the lessons of the past are insufficiently absorbed to prevent relatively frequent uh, recurrences of accidents that by now should be well controlled. And we mustn't forget that the deep water horizon involved, or the Macondo incident involved a major oil company, a uh, state-of-the-art rig from the world's largest drilling contractor, global top drill uh, contractors like Halliburton for the cement, Cameron for the BAP, Sperry Sun for the well logging and so on, uh, and providing all the key services. The European Union uh, is quite blessed, really, with a concentration of uh, regulatory systems that are recognised globally as being very robust. But no single regime can claim to aggregate all of the best practices. Uh, and so what the Commission did was to see the way forward for ensuring an adequate and reliable safety culture, consistent application of industry best practices, and some transparent sharing of the lessons learned from 
these incidents will be to level up the standards in the EU to the aggregate of the best practices applying both to, in, to industry and regulators that we already know about. Um, and that broadly has been the approach. Um, what I'll do now, um, just quickly, is tell you how this has worked. Um, taking the, um, the key objectives uh, as the three things on the left here, um, and working across as to what those general objectives should be and how you get some specific objectives from those. You're going to get these slides later, so I won't stick on them. Um, a number of measures were developed which meet those, uh, those four uh, specific objectives on the left-hand uh, left side of this slide now. Uh, look at the two red things that weren't proceeded with. Uh, the establishing an EU regulatory body uh, was definitely on the cards to begin with, a kind of super agency for regulating all of European waters. And I'm personally very happy to say that was not, uh, that was not sustainable uh, in analysis. And an EU intervention response capacity was also deemed not to be um, uh, a reasonable way to go as well. But these measures have formed, if you like, the backbone of a regulatory instrument, uh, the key points of which are on here, uh, and these are effectively are chapter headings in the, uh, in the draft regulation that's currently working its way through the so-called co-decision procedure, if you're interested in that, I can explain a little bit about that uh, questioning, but uh, so the general measures, um, risk-based planning and operations, if you would characterise the um, new EU regulation or the draft proposed legislative instrument, it's, uh, it's a risk-based goal-setting uh, approach uh, operating, if you like, through what we in the UK know as the safety case approach, um, but combining environmental impact as well as uh, safety um, analysis in the major hazard scenario, uh, spotting and all the control measures that flow from that. Um, Best practices by the operators and by the regulators. And for the regulators, that means forming up into a competent authority combining both safety and environmental regulators. It can be a many-headed beast. It can be, as we have onshore in the UK, the Environment Agency or the Scottish Environment Protection Agency north of the border, working with the agency as a competent authority under some very tight um, organisational arrangements and regulating the major hazard sites and their chemicals, petrochemicals, refineries, and so on. Um, coordination and cooperation amongst regulators. Um, uh, working to the highest standards for EU-based companies, anyway, when working outside of the European Union. Um, integrated emergency preparedness and response, which you can do if you actually start to account for environmental impact in your major hazard scenario planning. Uh, and there are a number of technical annexes which give the thing a bit of solidity that it might otherwise lack. Um, we've heard about the uh, UK industry response. It's very different from the UK government response, I might add, but uh, uh, one of the things that's absolutely hated about it is that this is actually a, a regulation, not a directive. A directive um, sets a, the goal to be attained by the member states and then transpose it into national law. Um, and the same directives for offshore, for example, apply to all member states. Um, but it's really only the North Sea member states that have got anything like a regime that anything remotely resembles a directive of which they're based. Um, and some, some of the regimes that have offshore operations, uh, Bulgaria and Romania, for example, so the Black Sea don't have any regulation at all. And the Irish um, regulatory regime, although it's changing, um, is almost a carbon copy of the, um, uh, of the prescriptive regime that existed prior to Piper and Alpha, uh, where indeed it was borrowed from. Um, so the Commission decided that a regulation would be the best way forward. Uh, this is seen by the UK industry and the Norwegians. Um, uh, to a certain extent, the Danes, the Dutch, as ever, are much more pragmatic about it. Um, as the um, 
as the European Union getting its hands on our oil and gas. And that, unfortunately, has been the rhetoric. Um, and for all the um, uh, admirable things that um, the trade associations do in the field of safety, environmental protection, and actually promoting good standards of the industry, there has been a lot more heat than light in the case that they are putting forward. Um, I, this is Mumbai High, by the way, and I just put that there to, to accompany the reaction of stakeholders. It has been, as I said, quite, uh, quite dramatic um, uh, over the regulation, uh, whereas um, the official government position in the UK and most member states, apart from, as I say here, from Germany and uh, Sweden, uh, the two-letter acronyms for those countries, D, E, and S, E, um, uh, think that a directive would help <coughs> those member states with the most robust regimes already that, mo that are most alike to the new regulation and the UK regime is particularly very, very close uh, to the uh, proposed European legislation, very, very close and that means because European legislation trumps national le legislation that the UK fear that they're going to have to uh, actually repeal and then rebadge and rewrite much of the regulation and the guidance that goes with it and so on, causing an unwarranted and un 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 uh, 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 undermining effect on UK law. Commission thinks otherwise, but that debate's ongoing and I'm sure it will get somewhere in the end. Um, but uh, some countries and the NGOs in particular think there sh it should be a strong regulation because the weaker countries are just hiding behind the coats of the... Um, North Sea countries say, yes, we want the directive as well for the same reason as they do, but frankly, the story goes, that's because they don't want to do anything about um, uh, improving the, the regimes in their areas for one reason or another. They think it might discourage further investment in their territory or they just think it could be um, remarkably expensive. Uh, that's that's the you know, what you might read about as a consensus. I've got no way of knowing that, but there is generally a a view that a directive would be um, would make a lot of people more happy. Broadly speaking, um, where this proposal has gone is through the uh, discussions in the council. The council represent the, the represent the uh, governments of the union. It's currently uh, headed up by Denmark. Denmark is the uh, has the presidency, and they produced a second further draft of what the commission produced. And it's all very positive. They're doing a progress report now and handing over to Cyprus. Very interesting, Cyprus just getting into business. And at the turn of the year, they'll hand over to Ireland as the presidency. And Ireland also have great ambitions to be um, a big player and hopefully will discover some big oil uh, in those really um, quite scary waters of the, um, of the Atlantic margin. <coughs> One thing that positive that has happened already is that the out of this regulation in its first form, the um, commission just took a decision for itself because it had the competence to do this, to form up uh, and, uh, an EU offshore authorities group comprising the um, um, regulators for the environment and safety uh, around the European Union. Um, and it's already had its first meeting. This is the... Uh, purpose of the group, I think it's going to be very good and uh, I'm delighted to uh, report that uh, my successor in the UK has uh, taken over as co-chair on behalf of the member states at the first meeting um, and they are uh, now building their agenda for um, exercising uh, influence over how the Commission and the rest of Europe proceeds and also give some, I think, forced magnification to what countries can do on their own to the big global companies um, that uh, dominate the industry. So I've got really high hopes for how that might perform. This is the uh, Danish uh, tyre field, by the way. Nice picture. Um, so uh, finishing up on Brent, actually, uh, on a windy day. Uh, and I noticed uh, on this, and those that have been offshore will be familiar with these conditions, they are something else. That the, the, the camera has got his back to the wind and there's absolutely no way he'd be able to hold a camera straight if you, straight if you were uh, facing straight into it. So I find that quite a nice picture. I think we've got to and thank you very much for your attention. And
the reference for all the information. Yeah, and, and you're happy to let your slides Absolutely, go online, yes. so this will be, there's no need to write. This will uh, be online in a few days' time. Okay, any, any questions? Yeah, please, at the back. I tell you what, it'd be good if you said who you were, because I'm sure you know who you are, but, uh, <laughs> and who you work for. Um, Tom Martin, um, Health and Safety Independent Consultancy. Uh, just in some quarters there has been criticism of the prescriptive American approach to safety. Um, it was interesting when you were talking about Macondo, you mentioned the companies, but very little mention of the regime. The EU has a bit of a reputation for having a bias towards process, and so it was really quite interesting to hear that the risk-based safety case. How, how are you, hopefully using your experience from the North Sea in, 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 in <laughs> constructive ways, how are you trying to um, ensure the EU doesn't fall, or the EU's approach to regulation in offshore in the North Sea, or offshore, uh, doesn't fall into the same trap of becoming the same prescriptive, um, process-based approach that OSHA had over in the States? Yeah. Um, well, the die is cast, really. Um, I mean, the draft uh, proposal uh, was adopted by the commissioners uh, in October uh, and, frankly, was a goal-setting risk-based regime that is very like um, the UK regime with bits of the Norwegian system in it and some things um, that take that even further. Um, and that went through a process, which I won't bore you with, but um, you had the result in October um, that um, it would be, let's say, North Sea-like, all well and good. I was very happy about that myself. Um, it's where it goes next, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> where the question is. Now, you've got, you've got a, the co-decision process in Europe uh, is rather fascinating. It's my first experience of it. Um, the, the, the mob that got going first were the Council of Ministers, if you like, the presidencies. Um, and they've been finessing it. The Brits have been really um, very constructive. The elephant in the room is always this, we don't want a regulation, we want a directive because we're the most robust regime and because we're most like what you're proposing, we have to dismantle all of ours to make it look like yours, you know, which is a waste of time and money and effort and so on. Um, but uh, the, the, the council have been finessing it without changing the design model, that it's uh, the primary responsibility is on the operators, the industry itself, that it's risk-based, it sets goals to be attained, desirable outcomes without going into the details, uh, that it's a minimum regulation so that member states can go further and can suit their own, their own um, uh, the, the sophistication and level of activity and the areas in which they operate. Clearly it's different in the Mediterranean to the uh, Arctic and the uh, Northwestern uh, Atlantic waters. Um, and they're about to publish a progress report. I've seen a draft of that. I've read it on the way out this morning, actually, uh, which they're going to put out and hand over to the, uh, to the Cyprus presidency. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it still looks good. It still looks like, you know, what's been evolving in Europe based on, you know, the dreadful happenings of the past, like Piper Alpha. However, it's now to go also to Parliament in, a, in the co-decision process. And Parliament... Um, is a, is, a, is a far less predictable quantity. Um, there are three committees who have got bits of it. Um, some parts of, uh, there's the environment group in which the environmental NGOs like Greenpeace, Bologna, uh, and so on uh, are, are very powerful. And it's groups like that that want to keep a regulation, uh, are pushing very hard for it, and are also saying that there needs to be a European super regulator and that there needs to be more detail and that member states can't be trusted because look at the state of the North Sea, you read the reports, look at Elgin, blah, blah, you know, major companies. Um, it's time that Europe actually regulated this from the centre. Um, so, you know, you've got these dynamics in play in Parliament. I don't know how it's going to play out. The leading committee is actually the Industry and Energy Committee, um, but it's, it is... They've, they've been fighting over these spoils quite bitterly, so I think there's going to be some, uh, some exciting dust-ups to come 
in Parliament. There'd be a lot of lobbying going on. There's quite a few sort of uh, maverick voices in there, you know, Nigel Farage, for example. Um, I don't know how that's going to go. But at the end of the day, it's necessary that the Parliament and the Council both agree on what the form of this should take. I think there may be, for example, more things in come into the regulation about workforce participation, um, uh, worker consultation and so on. The environmentalists will want more public participation in things like licensing, which um, you know, could get quite interesting. But um, at the moment, all well and good that we're on that course that you um, seem to be in favour of yourself. And, and you would say this will, this will be a regulation Well, I've never been through this before. I mean, I'm amazed at, you know, that uh, how quickly and slowly at the same time they work, how things happen in uh, Europe. It, I, I'm, it's still fairly mysterious to me, but uh, I think, um, no, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a good chance that it will be finished under the Irish presidency, yeah. Uh, depends how much priority is given to it now by the Cypriots, but they, they've actually said last week that it's their second highest priority after uh, energy pipelines, which um, is the top one. So it could be even this year, but I would suspect next year. Hi, Stephen Brooker from Bond Pierce Solicitors. Um, Taff, you and I had some problems with the coma regime during the Bunsfield case. Do you think the lessons learned about the inadequacies of the onshore coma regime are going to be resolved? Well, one of the things that... Um, is uh, an essential and defining part of the relationship between um, the operator and the regulator under the European proposal is uh, one of the difficulties in the coma regime, and that's that the coma regime has many good things about it, joint competent authority, safety in the environment, you assess the major hazards, the uh, consequences, the likelihoods, ergo the risks, the control measures and so on, and you put it into a report on the major hazards and you have a kind of a, a holistic joint regime, but the regulators themselves uh, do not have to do anything in particular with this report. Um, in the offshore proposal, the UK offshore practice, which is unique in Europe, of actually uh, taking a safety case, thoroughly assessing it within a, a, lim uh, within a, a limited time frame and accepting it, uh, and accepting only it so that if, if it's unacceptable in some form, then it gets sent back and it's recycled until eventually it becomes acceptable. That's the process being proposed by Europe. And that's gonna be different, for example, for the Danes and the Dutch and the Norwegians, if the Norwegians indeed come on board this. They're not in the European Union, but they're in the uh, um, European Economic Area, and that only means that they do follow. So um, uh, the, other, um, the other prevention, I think, is the um, is third-party verification, Stephen, uh, which I think um, that, that's a second pair of eyes. It, it actually can be second-party verification. Uh, so the bigger companies are quite capable of actually um, establishing a verification authority within their own organisation, but, but far away from the line management control. In my own experience, um, you know, in BP and, uh, and as, uh, as a regulator, is that actually um, colleagues in a company can be much tougher on you than a, a third-party verifier who you are actually paying as well, so like Lloyds or Denorska Veritas. So... Um, um, there's another layer of prevention there, um, and um, I think the wording of the regulation uh, avoids some of the, dare I say, it, sort of Reg 4 ambiguity and coma in the UK, which uh, is about taking all necessary measures and so on, which then needs qualifying. That doesn't mean doing everything possible as opposed to doing everything that's reasonable. Um, so uh, I, th I think we've kept a weather eye open, actually, for um, some, of the, some of the issues that came out of the uh, Cervezo Directive. 
Uh, obviously, you can. We've, we've written as well as you know. Uh, Connor Ryan to Loyal. Um, Taff, can you comment um, a bit more on the kind of uh, the, the liability and the compensation elements um, of the regulation? And uh, I'm thinking here of the impact that would have on the ability of smaller um, operators to explore, particularly, for example, in the Irish offshore, where yeah. a lot of smaller companies are a bit worried uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, and, and you've got a very powerful uh, lobby in Ireland, actually, which is preventing, uh, you know, uh, a more rapid development of the reserves that you have up the uh, west coast there. Um, this is a curious one, this, because um, it's like uh, God damn BP and God bless BP, wasn't it, in, in uh, Macondo, because uh, they had the capacity to get into that mess, but they actually had the wherewithal, both technically and particularly financially, to get out of it uh, and to come up with all this money. Um, and they could raise a lot of cash very quickly. They, got, they raised six billion dollars in, in suitcases from um, Standard Chartered and actually, you know, took the cash uh, and just started doling it out. Uh, there's not many organisations can produce that kind of clout. Unfortunately, um, industry, apart from in Norway really, uh, does rely on the smaller players to keep the, the sector going. So how are they going to actually come up with this? And it's actually proved to be a very difficult thing. All operators are entirely responsible for environmental liability. So they have to clean up the sea, basically. Um, but actually, that wasn't anything like the most expensive thing to do in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the only thing that's changed in this uh, proposal is that uh, water damage isn't your liability only inside your 12-mile, 20-kilometer uh, territorial line. It's now damaging it, water anywhere in your e exclusive economic zone out to 200 kilometers uh, means you've got to pay for the cleanup, but more or less that would happen anyway. And most of that would be covered by um, the conventions like uh, OPOL and so on that already exist and most, uh, most states have some kind of access to. The big issue is economic damage, damage to coastal economies, ship it, uh, fishing and so on. Um, and that's, uh, that's a real problem, and there's really nothing on the market. There is no inst market instrument that can actually cover the kind of losses that we now have to calibrate for after Macondo. Um, and uh, at the time of putting these proposals together, there was absolutely nothing that the Commission could sort of dream up that would actually make any sense um, about that. And it's not just having vast sums of money behind you so that you don't go bust and then internalise all those costs to the country that's unfortunate enough to have the incident in its, in its territory, about, about which it's very, has very little of the, you know, of the blame for. Um, it, it's also paying up quickly enough, again, as happened in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, so you can get a queue of small businesses, little restaurants and whatever, beach resorts that can actually uh, get some sort of compensation, even if they're entitled to it or not, you can claim that back to them later, but before they actually go bust and then when the money's available, it's no good to them because that business has gone away and you've actually, um, um, you've actually uh, kind of um, uh, 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 sort of ruined that part of the economy. Um, so there's the issue of paying up quickly enough as well. And that's so complicated because, uh, you know, in the, the civil claims areas of all member states, it's so different, it's so complicated um, that, uh, you know, under commercial law um, uh, that might apply across the member states and so on. So what actually we're doing at the moment, there's, there's in the official journal, there's um, a tender document that's been out. Um, I think the tenders are due in in about a month uh, to do some research into what kind of hybrid of pooling instruments, insurance on the market, and other things, guarantees uh, can be compiled, if you like, to create uh, a traditional damages, it's called, traditional damages compensation scheme that will actually continue to uh, give uh, states and their neighbours some kind of confidence that uh, they're not actually um, sitting on a uh, sitting on the sort of edge of ruin, if you like, if you remember the slide before with the dragon and the hole in the sea, um, just waiting for something to go wrong and not having the financial wherewithal to cover that. Very complex, though, and the member states like Belgium that don't have any offshore industry 
are really on the case here. They're really saying that the other, you know, like the North Sea countries like Netherlands and the UK just aren't doing enough and the Commission's not doing enough. But it's really, really difficult. Well, <coughs> there is a there. One of the articles of the regulation, draft regulation, actually says that uh, um, the uh, best best practice for operators is those operators that uh, are based in the um, EU, so you know, Totals, Statoil, if uh, Norway joins, BP, Shell, uh, you've got a pretty nice selection there. Uh, will follow EU standards when working or at least EU standards are working overseas. Um, that's been objected to as bad law because how are you going to enforce that? You, know, you can't go and carry out an investigation anywhere else. You can't, uh, what penalties might you apply? Um, so that's been kicked about a bit. But I think it's right to keep it, actually. Um, if you think of what um, Chevron have had two incidents that we've heard about today. One off Brazil, where they're getting absolutely hammered, and uh, it looks a bit savage, but, and one off the coast of Nigeria, uh, where there's some fatalities as well. Um, and the US uh, wants Chevron to come and talk to them and tell them what is going on, what is happening. Um, if we can have those conversations, if, um, if the UK regulator, the UK government has got under the, if you like, the encouragement of a, of, a, of a EU regulation, the capacity to call BP in at the very highest level, and believe me, it was very difficult to sit after Macondo to get to talk to BP at the highest level. They simply did not want to come in and talk uh, at that level uh, uh, to, um, to HSE. But if at ministerial level you can have these conversations and they can do that in France with Total and uh, in the UK or Holland you can do it with Shell, I think that's actually quite a powerful discussion to be had even behind closed doors and maybe some limited communique afterwards because there's nothing that uh, a, a global oil company values more, might be a share price I suppose, than its, uh, than its sense of corporate social responsibility. So I think the balance is worth keeping it in, but it is soft law, you can't do anything with it. Uh, one more question and then we'll, we'll do a break for our, the uh, coffee and cheese is getting cold. And the, and the biscuits slowly rotting. Uh, okay, uh, uh, those uh, uh, biscuits are late. Short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, probably it's, it's probably a twofold question. It's, uh, but uh, the name is Paul Weskey, I'm with Mole Tank now, but uh, for my last eight years I was with crisis management. I was with the uh, BP, I was the regional crisis manager uh, for Russia, Caspian, Middle East and Africa, and then down with Tour. And where I'm coming from is, yes, it's great to see legislation coming in to try and endorse it, to make sure that there is a certain level of military response to the offshore industry. Because I've seen, it depends on companies, depends on where you go, there's such a major difference. But where do you go about changing the whole culture and ensure that emergency response for major disasters is put right at the start? Because even big companies such as BP, I've seen, we built the BTC pipeline, one of the biggest pipelines in the world, build a great big uh, refinery, a tank plant, done with stages, at the end of it they go, oh, there's no firefighting capability. We never thought about it. It was never put in the start phase. The actual, right before the conception of the idea, it's difficult to get that emergency response in because it's always seen to be, well, we have an accident, it gets put aside, the money will, oh, we'll deal with that later. And especially now we find, after this has happened, it's two years now, 
companies are starting to go, it's not a big event now, we can forget about it, we can divert more money towards health and safety, we don't need to go towards a you know, response to emergency management. How do we get that whole culture changed within the industry? Yeah. One of the <coughs> um, I, I mean, the industry changes its own culture by wanting to, uh, and you've got to, and you need line of sight, don't you, from from the board uh, down to the you know to kind of the far reaches of your operation. Um, you know, this question of how do you know is, is a great question to ask the managing director, as it is uh, the um, the process uh, technician uh, walking the plant. How do you know? Uh, where you are with, uh, with uh, safety and prevention. Um, but I think you've got to discriminate between standards and, um, and this kind of thing called culture. Um, there, there is a list of elements uh, in the, one of the acts of the regulation which talks about uh, uh, a strong culture and it tends to focus more on high reliability and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a high reliability organisation is uh, an organisation with a strong safety culture. It's a bit circular, I know, uh, with, a, with, a, with a very strong chance of, of conducting safe and continuous operations. So, you know, actually uh, unsafe companies are ones that always have the kind of uh, lumpy flow, if you like, through their business. I mean, it's a bit stop-go. You don't finish everything you want to do in your planned shutdown in the summer. So you come out of the shutdown slightly less worse shape than you intended to be, and so on and so on. The very high reliable companies, r high reliability companies, and there aren't many in the oil industry, I have to say. They, there are some classic sectors that, that uh, can, can genuinely claim to be that. Um, French high-speed train system, for example, aircraft carriers, there's some quite, some parts of the civil aviation system. Um, but uh, the regulatory framework, if it sets goals, then you need standards to give the goals some solidity. And if it's comprehensive enough so that it doesn't stop short at just when everybody's dead or off the platform, that's the end of it, there's a consequence, the response to it. And, and on Elgin, of course, they have the intriguing prospect, uh, which is not in the safety case for that platform, of having got everybody off in a, with military precision, you know, very very uh, good looking exercise to evacuate 238 people, no mean feat in the North Sea, without any incident at all, but they've got to get them back to actually deal with the incident. And that's a huge challenge and no thinking was done uh, with all respect to Total and HSE and so on because the safety case stops at the point when everybody's safe. Um, the, the more holistic regime envisaged for Europe is that actually you'd be thinking of the consequences from that point onwards, and this was actually the, uh, the worst blowout in the North Sea for um, 35 years. I mean, it was gas mainly, but of condensate, so not oil, but uh, so you've got to go back to um, Ecofisk uh, Bravo in 1977, 35 years before, to actually see something like that. I mean, for, 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 for uh, how many, 50-odd uh, days blowing out at something like 200,000 cubic metres a day, 120 tonnes of gas a day, it's quite a big big, big, big uh, bill, uh, but every, all the thinking for that had to be done afterwards, which is the point you're making, I think, so that, uh, that leaves it up front. Um, I think you can actually regulate for that, but only in framework terms. The rest of the thinking needs to be done by the companies that uh, are highly capable of it, but sometimes miss the trick. Okay, very good. Okay, I think, uh, well, you've done two things there in the last five minutes. You've set up our next uh, two talks after the break quite well. So, one, what you do before and when and what you do when you have a problem. So, we'll, we'll see where we get to. Ta thank you very much. Thank you for everything.